Okay, I have goosebumps. <laughs> Definitely, you can probably see them in the back row from there. Which means either that I'm freezing and I want to fluff my fur up, or that I am in the presence of something very, very good. More of this, please. I actually do have a great faith in things like goosebumps and we've got an innate biological capacity to know what is important for our survival. We do. And the hair on the back of my neck rose about three years ago and it hasn't gone down. <laughs> like a little mohawk back there. Do you all have that? We should dye them together. <laughs> recognize one another. <laughs> but we made it here, and it's been a heck of a year. Despite our best efforts to stop it, we watched um, the opening of The Empire Strikes First, which is a very old tale. It's a remake. And we watched the recall of democracy all over, latest being in Sacramento, as you know, I'm sorry. And we watched this collapsing worldwide of human rights to a single, what seems like a single sovereign right, which is the right of the moneyed to make more money. And in the process to suck the marrow from earth and culture, leaving these broken bones of poverty behind. Okay. We have a stranglehold on the problem space. We see it clearly, and our hair is standing up on the backs of our neck. But we have not gone mad yet, and we have not lost hope. I mean, I look the people here are each holding, for those of you on satellite, the people in this audience are holding seedlings in their lap. And they're little pieces of the solution. And it is a rowdy, diverse bunch of solutions out there. It's a rowdy forest. There are 4,000 different species of solutions. And that's exactly what we're going to need, because we have no idea what's going to happen. So let's keep this diversity, okay? There is no such thing as junk DNA, okay? It's just stuff we don't know what we're gonna use it for yet. So thank you for wading through that ocean of grief with your seedling held high above your head, okay? Thank you. You know what we get to do? this weekend is we get to put those seedlings side by side and we get to stand back and imagine the kind of lush forest that could stitch up the gash in Gaia's side. This is how we reimagine the world. That's what we're here for. The people in the satellite locations, I am really glad. What do we have? We have 12. 12 new biomes, welcome to you. And I would say, please take care of your home places for us. And we'll take care of our home places for you. The thing is, the Earth is going to need a lot of rest and replenishment in the coming years. Create fertility wherever you go. Create capacity. Because things are getting a little crazy. Okay, January 6th, sitting in my pajamas doing the favorite thing that a nature nerd does, reading her new, new scientist magazine <laughs> that's come in. And there are two landmark studies that were published in Nature that week. Uh, both of them from women scientists, Terry Root, right here in, in Stanford. Thank you, Terry. What these did was they looked at plants and animals in temperate regions and how they're responding already to global climate change, okay?
because they got tired of people saying, you know, yeah, maybe plants and animals are, are affected by this one degree of, of temperature rise, but it's anecdotal. You know, it's anecdotal, which is, in the Victorian era, it used to be called hysterical. You know, <laughs> it's, it's our antidotal is our hysterical. Um, anyway, they did a meta study. They looked at about 3,100 species in all. The vast majority of them are on the move already with one degree change, okay? They are moving at a rate in this part of the world from south to north. They're moving about four miles a decade, which is a lot if you're going acorn by acorn, right? Uh, some are going, uh, the checker spot butterfly, your Edith checker spot is 60 miles already. It's moved, okay? Um, it's now on a collision course with San Diego, evidently, <laughs> which means that if the city council has not put money aside for butterfly corridors, now is a good time. You know, we've got breeding and blossoming happening earlier, lots earlier, about five days earlier per decade, which is a lot, because if you are a flower and you bloom and your pollinator hasn't made it yet, we're all in trouble, okay? There are refugees coming to your home places, both natural and human. And so we got to get really good right now at removing excess stress like pollution and habitat degradation. As if we didn't need enough motivation, here it is. So, we need life-enhancing lifeways. And luckily, right outside that door, there's a salt marsh, and in that salt marsh, there are thousands of species, and beyond that, there are 30 million species who have figured out these life-enhancing lifeways for millions and billions of years they've had practice. So biomimicry is this process of going to them for advice and then emulating designs and strategies. It's not going and, and grinding them up and making natural products out of them. It's not taking their gene and putting it in another animal's gene. Um, it's not domesticating them and milking out what we want. It's asking for their recipe. It's asking for their designs. It's asking for their relationship strategies and then trying to emulate them. And it is the most hopeful thing in my world. Um, what I'd like to do is show you some examples, some new examples that I, I think might be um, Ones that might point to things that you're going to be talking, we're going to be talking about a lot uh, this weekend. Water, obviously, is going to be a huge one, okay? So how would nature cope with drought? And the beetle up there is this little Namibian beetle, and it lives in a place that has no groundwater, okay? And yet a little bit of fog comes in at about 50 miles an hour with some water in it, and it raises its wing scales, and it's got these bumps on it, Okay, that are water loving and water shedding sides and it grabs some of that water and it starts to ball up and then it goes down the chutes into the critter's mouth. It's a beautiful little adaptation and we're now mimicking it and putting it on the sides of desert refugee camp tents okay, for harvesting water and putting sheets of it up to have agriculture in arid areas. Beautiful little adaptation. There's also a lot of insects that pull water out of air down to 47% relative humidity, they can pull water out of air, like ticks and silverfish and pill bugs. That's a little pill bug down there. Anyway, we're looking at those as a model for desiccants, okay, to pull water out of air, like in hot and humid environments where you want to dry air before you bring it into a building so that you don't have to spend so much energy cooling it. And for a big public health issue, which is mold, um, to dry out air, in, in areas that are too humid, um, a desiccant that works like the pill bug and then would take water and bring it into your home would be a very cool thing. PVC is a big one. All kinds of plastics are a big one. How would nature make a green plastic? My sense is that these leaves basically are starches and sugars that were made from carbon dioxide, which is something we have a lot of right now. 
So there's actually the most exciting work that I'm looking at these days is a guy named Jeff Coates at Cornell who has found it's the holy grail, really, in green chemistry, which is to find a way to take the excess CO2 and turn it into biodegradable plastics. <laughs> Fabulous stuff. Because what we're saying there is, let's not ask the plants to do our work for us. Let's not mine soil fertility. Let's take what we have in excess ourselves and make, be plant-like and make it into biodegradable plastics. Incredible work. This is a beauty. This is Venus flower basket, a glass sponge. And to get off oil, one of the ways to get off oil is to just stop using so much of it for our brute force processes and manufacturing processes, which are incredibly high temperature, high pressures, lots of chemicals, lots of oil being used. This glass sponge, if you can see those little fibers on the ends, those fibers are better than our fiber optics. Okay, these are scientists at AT&T, a woman named Joanna Eisenberg, who also looked at the brittle snark. Now she's looking at the glass sponge. And what she's saying now, read the press reports. It's very interesting. She's saying, these are better than our fiber optics. And you can tie a knot in these things, which you can't with ours, obviously. And what she's saying in the press out loud is, the important thing about this is that it's not using high temps, it's chemistry in water, and that's why it's so incredible, and we have to figure out a way to process, manufacture in this way. Really exciting stuff. Once a biomimic, always a biomimic. Distributed energy. Here's a picture of a little organic, thin film solar cell. And the one on the left is uh, an abalone, mother of pearl, forming. Okay, in the ocean, it's a self-assembly process, and that PV cell is basically a dip process, and as you pull it out, a photovoltaic cell forms, a thin fill cell. So imagine spraying that on your roof. That's the idea. Very, very cheap. It's not as good an energy uh, percentage right now, but it's incredibly cheap and it's organic. I really want this one. I want to look fabulous without chemicals. And um, butterflies, morpho butterflies. This is structural color. There are no pigments in morpho butterflies and peacocks, except for brown. It's done with light coming through these layers and reflecting back. And now there's a company, it's an environmental technology company called Tijin, very small. They've created a fiber called Morphotex. It's on the left there. There is no pigment in that fiber. It's done with light. Very cool and fabulous, which we want. I do. Um, antibiotic resistance is going to be a huge one for obvious reasons. How would nature repel microbes without really getting them mad and making them really, really strong? This is a plant called the sea purse in Botany Bay, Australia. What it does is release an organic molecule called a furanone and that furanone jams the communication signals of bacteria. Bacteria, I guess, are talking to each other all the time. They're signaling. And when they go to land on something, they land, and then they signal to their friends who all come down. Well, this thing sends out this little note saying, don't bother. <laughs> don't bother landing here, basically. It's very interesting. A keto form of disease prevention. So here it is, just learning from the locals, okay? Not just about them, but from them. They've been here a lot longer than we have. Here are some next steps real quick. We're working on um, putting biologists at every design table so that designers and engineers can ask, how would nature do this and how wouldn't nature do this of the biologists? We got money for, with our RMI to do a uh, nature solutions database to start to put biological information on the web so that everyone around the world can view it for free in a design context. <laughs> so that life's ideas are not able to be patented. It's a biggie.
And we're working on this design course at the university level and the K through 12 level in which we teach biology functionally. So you can go somewhere and you can say, how does nature thermoregulate? How does nature filtrate? How does nature look fabulous all the time? And we're at the beginning stages of that. I am a huge fan of Linux because that's what creates not just the genius, but the grace that you see out there, the grace. Limits are just a, a, a design challenge. It's a focusing mechanism. So you see, I see limits out there. I see limits to growth, limits to size and scale, limits to where genes move from one organism to another, limits to resource hoarding. I see limits, and I want a department of limits. I want us to celebrate. I, I, I don't want any more contests that we award record breakers. In, in, in the natural world, breaking limits is like a, a quick, short thrill, quickly followed by extinction. Okay? I want a department of limits that is called the Department of Design Challenges. And we as a society go one after another. Let's do without PVC. Let's see what that's like. That's what I would like. There's a lot of diversity in the natural world, but there is a code of conduct that I see out there. There are some non-negotiables out there, and one of them is that the criteria of success is that you keep yourself alive and you keep your offspring alive. But it's not your offspring, it's your offspring's offspring's offspring 10,000 years from now. And because you can't be there to take care of that offspring, the only thing you can do is to take care of the place that takes care of your offspring. So that's why the one non-negotiable policy that we need to write into law is this. It's that life creates conditions conducive to life. That's the design challenge, and that's the non-negotiable for me. Can we write that into policy? Absolutely we can write that into policy. Absolutely. When the hair on everybody's neck starts to go up, we're going to start to look for, we're going to look at limits a little bit differently. Let me tell you one more story, which comes from a workshop, the last workshop that we did in Montana. And there were architects there. And it's amazing. They, were designing with natural teachers all around them. They had biology books out all around them. They were asking us biological questions. And one of the teams was looking at um, a way to store some of the water that comes down in Chicago in huge storms that usually winds up mixing with sewage and going out into uh, the, the lake, okay? And they wanted to do something different. They wanted to jungleify the city, of course, to get some sponging going on, and they wanted rooftop gardens. But they also wanted to get a network, a root network, that we would grab some of the water and bring it back to our buildings. So if it rained in one part of the city, you'd get some water, and you'd be able to have a root network. And they were going to put it under the sidewalks all around the city. And they had done so much thinking about biological principles that PVC was not, on, was not possible to them. Hard pipes were not possible to them. They started to ask me questions about earthworms and about peristalsis, about moving the skin of a worm to move water along, okay? And how that would work, and how does our digestive tract work? What's the gel under a snail, and how does that gel absorb water very quickly? And they did a lot of reading. These are not biologists, but they did a lot of reading and then they got up and they gave, at the la on the last day, they gave this presentation like they, they would give to their city hall. It was amazing. They had all these charts and everything and they were describing to us the problem and they said, you know, we wanna get, we wanna get some of this water and we wanna have it slowly absorb and be able to go back to buildings. And they said, you know, we, um, we don't wanna use motors. An absolutely pan face, you know, just, we don't wanna use motors. Uh, we're not going to be using any fossil fuels. We want the minimum of energy. And um, we don't want any fans. And we don't want a central processing where we have to send the water somewhere and then get it filtered. We want it distributed 
So, of course, and they looked at each other, we went with a peristolic system. <laughs> As if it was a term already. And we all nodded. <laughs> and it, then we burst into laughter. We were crying because, not because it was preposterous, but because it was so right and it was so possible. And for a moment, it became the only alternative. And they said, at the end of their presentation, you know where you thank people? They had down there, and for our inspiration, uh, we would like to thank uh, earthworms, <laughs> banana slugs, and our own digestive tract. <laughs> It does a biologist's heart good, I'll tell you what. It really does. Um, this is how we reimagine the world. Have fun. I'll see you next time.